Hello everyone, in this lesson we are going to be learning about covalent bonds. And there are a couple of different types, including nonpolar, um, multiple, and polar. So this is going to be a relatively involved lesson. Um, make sure that you're in the mindset where you can uh, take really thorough notes today. I know that sometimes we get into a habit of taking more like shortened notes, but I think today's notes are going to be really important for you later on in terms of um, understanding chemistry, but also your grade. So make sure you take really excellent notes today. We have a book work associated with this lesson. So my hope is that we'll be able to do uh, questions 14 through 17 on page 105 um, for uh, during class tomorrow. Um, and our aim is what are the properties of covalent bonds? Um, you may have seen something like this in the summary yesterday, but this is going to become our do now for today. Um, just give me some properties of um, the change in nonmetals as they become ions, some of the ways metals change when they become ions. And this is a really excellent question, so make sure you have that copied. And so is this one. All right. So the type of bond that forms between two hydrogen atoms is covalent. There are a couple of reasons why. The first one is that the two hydrogen atoms are both nonmetals, and we know that between two nonmetals, you'll always have a covalent bond. But there is probably a more excellent response than that. Um, and it would be something like this. Um, the two hydrogen atoms, they both have the same electronegativity. And that means that they both desire to gain an electron an equal amount. It doesn't need to be high or low, but they're both equal, considering that they're both the same element. Therefore, if they're both pulling on electrons with exactly the same amount of force, let's say, then neither one is going to take the electron from the other. Therefore, if, they, if the two atoms have the same electronegativity, then they must share electrons equally. And that's the definition of covalent bond, is equal sharing of electrons. So after all that, I just wrote that electronegativity difference is zero. This is a really high level region's response because it's saying that if you take the electronegativity of this atom, and subtract it from the electronegativity of this atom, you get zero, which means that you'll have equal sharing. So I have some vocabulary. And that's that if you have a covalent compound, like this uh, molecule of hydrogen here, um, you can, well, I just said it. You can give it a special name of molecule. So molecule is a word that is only applicable for covalently bonded substances. So please write this sentence. Um, and then lastly, I have to introduce the word diatomic. So nonmetal elements tend to bond in pairs, are described as diatomic. We also say the heavenly seven for this. The heavenly seven are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Um, I'm going to circle the um, gaseous heavenly seven in red. That's gonna be hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Those will be gases. I have one liquid, and that's gonna be bromine. And I have one solid in the heavenly seven. So we have, let's see, five gases, one liquid, and one solid. All right, so let's test our vocabulary with this little organization table at the bottom. Um, let's say that you have a little dude, CH4, right here. The question is, is it a compound? The answer is yes. And the reason is because it is a group of atoms that are bonded together and they don't have a charge. The next question is, is it a molecule? And to be a molecule, you have to be a covalent substance. And both carbon and hydrogen are nonmetals, so this is a covalent substance. And yes, it is a molecule. 
And the last question is, is it diatomic? Um, the only diatomics that you need to know are right here. And this is not one of those things. So diatomic is no. For Cl2, yeah, sure, it's a compound. It's a group of atoms bonded together with no charge. Is it a molecule? Yeah, it is, because it's a, it's a compound composed entirely of nonmetals. And is it diatomic? Yes, because it has two atoms of the same element bonded together. Last example is KBr. Um, this group of atoms um, is bonded with no charge between them. They've canceled each other out, so we're going to say yes, it's a compound. It's not a molecule, however, and the reason is because potassium is a metal. And in order to be a compound, you have to be two nonmetals. I mean, it's, in order to be a molecule, you have to be two nonmetals. So no, it's not a molecule, and it's also not diatomic, because to be diatomic, you have to be two atoms of the same element bonded together. So this slide is about nonpolar covalent bonds. When you do your notes, I think you should have like a little bit of a like a little subheading that says nonpolar covalent bonds. Um, and the first focusing question is: Do you think that electrons in diatomic molecules are shared equally? So an example of a diatomic molecule could be um, F2, or when you have two fluorine atoms bonded together. And the, the idea here is that electrons are shared equally, and that's because the two atoms in the bond have the same electronegativity, and um, would, neither one would be, over, would be able to overpower the other, so they would definitely share electrons equally. The next question says that magnets have north and south poles. The Earth also has north and south poles. And the word pole is just referring to um, this concept of two sides being opposites. And if that's what polar means, then the word nonpolar would mean that you do not have two opposite sides. All right, so to the meat of this slide, Covalent bonds are nonpolar if the atoms making the bond have the same attraction for electrons. This is what we would call electronegativity. Um, and then the kinds of compounds that contain these nonpolar bonds are going to be the same compounds that have an electronegativity difference of zero. And as we were just discussing, those compounds are called diatomic molecules. So again, in short, diatomic molecules such as a molecule of nitrogen, um, those two atoms of nitrogen have the same electronegativity. So this bond in between the two atoms is going to have electrons being shared perfectly equally. And that has to be true because electronegativity difference is zero. Therefore, it's not going to be different on two sides of the bond. It'll be perfectly equal sharing, and we're going to call that kind of sharing nonpolar sharing. So it definitely contains a nonpolar bond. Um, this diagram right down here does show nonpolar bonding because you have um, symmetry in the electron cloud that is between the two nuclei. So I want you to put a new subheading that has multiple covalent bonds as the title. And um, basically, there are cases when atoms would, bo would bond to each other, but one bond would not fulfill the valence shell of either atom. And you need to remember that the whole point of bonding is to fulfill the valence shell. So in order to satisfy the valence of both atoms in a compound, atoms must sometimes have more than one multiple covalent bond between them. This is a very important idea to record in your notes. My next move here is that we should look at this table. And um, what I've done here is I've put together three diagrams that could represent the electrons around 
um, the nitrogen atoms in a molecule of nitrogen. But two of them are definitely wrong, and one of them is right. And although I don't want you to learn how to draw them today, I do want you to be able to see which ones are wrong and which ones are right and why. So I'll model that for you now. Um, we start with this original question, valence electrons on each atom, um, which would be all the electrons that surround one atom. But, so if I'm looking at this one, it would be all the ones I'm circling, but not these. Those belong to the other atom. So um, let's just count the valence electrons on each atom. So right now I see, for this atom, I see one, two, three, four, five, and six. So it would be the same for the other atom as well. For this atom, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we are getting closer to the magic number eight, but not there yet. And then for this atom, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I know now that this is the correct structure for the molecule of nitrogen. And when you count the number of covalent bonds here, I'm going to zoom in again because this is super important. The covalent bond is two electrons together. So I have one bond here. There's my second bond. And there's my third bond. So one, two, three. All right, so we can answer these questions now. How many bonds exist between the atoms of nitrogen? The answer is three, and it's because it will fulfill the valence of eight electrons. I want you to circle this one because I have this question on your next quiz. Now next, I have how many electrons exist between the atoms of nitrogen. So what I would say is that you can sort of see it right here. It's really one, two, three, four, five, six electrons, even though it's only three bonds. And the reason for that is because there are two electrons in each bond. So I will say six electrons, which is similar to saying three bonds. And are the bonds nonpolar? Absolutely yes. And the reason for that is because the electronegativity difference is zero for these atoms. So one more subheading, children. Um, I want you to have one more subheading that says polar covalent bonds. And um, this is one of the very most important things that you need to write down. So the electrons in a molecule of HCl which is not diatomic because it has two different elements in the bond. Um, the electrons between the H and the Cl are shared in a covalent bond. It's definitely true because both H and Cl are nonmetals. But they're not shared equally. And the simple reason to explain why is that H has an electronegativity of 2.1 and Cl has an electronegativity of three point something. So they have different electronegativities, and chlorine, in fact, is more electronegative than hydrogen. So that means that the electrons are going to move closer to chlorine than hydrogen. I'll draw a diagram that represents that now. This diagram represents that because it has an arrow that points towards chlorine, which means that chlorine is going to be the more negative side of the molecule. And we have almost, um, almost a positive sign near hydrogen, meaning that since it's going to have electrons less often, it's going to be sort of positive. So we have hydrogen being the sort of positive side because it's electron poor. Um, and we have chlorine being the sort of negative side because it's going to be electron rich compared to hydrogen. So would it be appropriate to refer to the bond in HCl as nonpolar? 
Absolutely not. And the reason for that is because there is an electronegativity difference of more than zero. So covalent bonds are polar if the atoms making the bonds have different attractions for electrons. You can tell if a covalent bond is polar, essentially, without looking at table S, because we've been talking about electronegativities, so you might be thinking table S is going to be super involved, and it's not that you can't use table S, you certainly can, but all you really have to do is trust that if you have two different elements, they're going to have different electronegativities. So basically, if you have two different elements involved in a bond, the bond has to be polar. So I just wrote that down for you here, but just in case you need examples to clarify, um, HCl, which we just said, is an example. Um, let's see, HBr would be an example as well. Um, OF2, that would be an example. Um, C, Cl4 would be an example. Um, so basically, all you need to know there is that if you have two different elements involved in a bond, the bonds must be polar. So I'm going to write polar bonds. All right, now, take a look at these four examples of polar mo uh, molecules. And um, they all have polar bonds because H and F are different electronegativities. Different electronegativities, different electronegativities, different electronegativities. But I can tell you which one is the most polar by looking at which one has the largest electronegativity difference. And this kind of logic works because if the difference in their electronegativities is really large, then they're going to be sharing electrons very poorly. So the larger the electronegativity difference, the more covalent the bond. You'll need to use table S to figure out which one has the very largest electronegativity difference. But I can tell you that it's going to be this one. And so basically, I'm ignoring the H because it's the same for all of those molecules. But fluorine has an electronegativity of 4. And all the other guys, Cl, Br, and I, are going to be less than 4. So the difference between the H and the F, or the H and the CL, or the H and the BR, or the H and the I, is going to be largest here. So it's HF is going to have the most polar bond. Um, lastly, this diagram. The ways that it shows um, polar bonding is that you have asymmetry in the electron cloud between the two nuclei. So please copy down these pair-up questions even include those sketches at the bottom. Also copy down these summary questions, and we'll answer these in class tomorrow. So you'll have a separate page of classwork that has the do now questions, the pair up, and the summary questions, and it'll also list the bookwork that we'll do in class tomorrow. Thank you for watching.